dressing and cranberry sauce and macaroni and cheese and collard greens and sweet potato pie. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Shelby. <laughs> Ooh, yes, Lord. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. And uh, we're just glad to still be alive and well and seated and clothed and in our right minds. It could have been the other way. So much has happened even over a season where we uh, be reflecting on how thankful we are. Uh, yet so much has still happened. Um, yet we are every day seeing another reason to appreciate life and the simplicity of it uh, with the uh, events that transpired on Thanksgiving night at the uh, Galleria. And uh, we're definitely lifting up all the families who were involved and anybody that was there. Uh, my cousin may have just left from up there. Um, her Nokia was actually there in J.C. Penney, so we just glad that God kept her safe and protected and she's still alive and, and with us and I'm not sure of any of our other church members that were there and if you heard a gunshot or just saw people running, that's scary enough as it is to, to not know what's going to happen um, but God will keep you from danger seen and unseen and if he ain't through with you yet you ain't going nowhere until God gets through with you. Can I get a witness from somebody that know he's a keeper, he's a protector, he's a shield, he's a buckler, he's a refuge and strength. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are saved. And we're just so glad that you guys are here with us. We've got several who are out of town and visiting families for the holidays, and so uh, we're still going to go on in, in the name of the Lord. We had a great worship for eight. 15, 8.15, uh, we'll be starting at 8.30, but it's supposed to be 8.15, um, but we had a great time this morning, and thankful for those that came, and here we are at this worship experience, and we're going to give the Lord his just due, and then we're going over to Hoover, and praise God again for our third worship of the day, so I'll continue to pray our strength in the Lord as we do what God has called us to do for such a time as this. I want to travel to the book of Genesis. Shouldn't take us too long to find it. All you got to do is literally open the Bible. <laughs> open the Bible like right there to page one or two. After you go past the table of contents and the Holy Bible portion, you'll be right in the book of Genesis. But we're going to travel to chapter 32. Genesis chapter number 32. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. The reason I like reading from New Living Translation is just because it's an easier writing, uh, easier read than the New Living Translation. But it's very closely resembled to the King James Version. While we're doing that, any young people that are going to participate in our Children Church Hour, feel free to go ahead and go to the back. If you're 12 and under, you would like for your child to participate, feel free to go back so that they can learn the word of the Lord on their level in children's church have a very exciting time one of these days i'm gonna just take off and go to children's church i'm gonna just go i ain't playing either uh, i thought i saw this pastor yeah he in children's church i'm gonna be coloring in everything <laughs> in jesus name i i miss coloring david and goliath back in the day <laughs> i went to sunday school 101 amen chapter 32 of genesis I'm going to start reading at verse number 22, and then we'll go down through verse number 28, Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 28. And if you don't have a Bible, you can just read it on the screen with us. It says, during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. While the man saw that he would not win the match, when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. 
But Jacob said, bro, you came to fight me. I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. You ain't going to keep me up all night and not give me no blessing. What is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. And then the final verse, 28, here's the blessing. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Can we all say amen? amen? I want you to look at your neighbor like you got a secret to tell them. Look at them like you're about to tell on yourself. Like you <laughs> Look at them like you got a little snitch in your blood. Like you got a little snitch in your blood. <laughs> and say, hey, you might not believe me. But right now, I am going through the fight of my life. That's what I want to talk about, the fight of my life. And if that sound a little bit like what you're going through, let everybody say amen. amen. <laughs> Allow me, if you will, forthrightly, before we get too deep into this message, to give you quick substance by submitting and suggesting to you very strongly that the fight of your life is the fight for your life. The fight of your life is the fight for your life, which leads us to a subsequent reality, which is, quite frankly, there are certain battles in your life that you can neither afford to avoid nor lose. I can't not fight it, and I definitely can't afford to lose it. Which is why, I, at the expense of sounding redundant, I have to tell you that Genesis chapter 32 therewith has got to be one of the most powerful chapters in the whole entire Bible because it is Genesis chapter 32 that gives us vital information on how to become victorious in the fight of your life. If you miss Genesis chapter 32, the next time you get into the fight of your life, it's a strong possibility you might not win. That's how strong Genesis chapter 32 really is. Let, let me go ahead and give you the end from the beginning just in case you're taking note because these are not going to be on the screen but I need you to take note of this. Put it in your cell phone or write it on a pad and put it on a sticky note and, and attach it to your refrigerator or put it on your wall because what I'm getting ready to share with you is something that is going to help you through 2019 to take your life to the level that God would have it to be. Three things I need to share with you forthrightly, and I want you to get this in your spirit as well as in your notes. Number one, the fight of your life is a fight that you have to fight by yourself. You have to fight it by yourself. I want you to put your hand on your heart and say, by myself. By myself. By myself. Say it again, by myself. by myself. Now, secondly, the fight of your life is not only a fight that you have to fight by yourself, but it is also a fight that you have to fight with yourself, with yourself. So put your hand on your heart and say, with myself. With Come on, one more time, with myself. with myself. Third and finally, the fight of your life is a fight that you have to fight. This is going to trip you out, but you have to fight this fight for yourself. So put your hand on your heart and say, for myself. For one more time, for myself. Let me go back and put a little meat on each one of these bones. I'm going to say a word about each one, and then we're going to raise up because I believe that when the Holy Spirit stops speaking, then I should stop speaking as well. And so I want to give you what he says and then give you something to take home with you that you can be blessed thereby for the duration of your life. If you would examine Genesis chapter 32, you would know one thing right off the bat, that a brother by the name of Jacob is the central character in Genesis chapter 32. Jacob is a very important person to become acquainted with in the scripture because, in fact, oftentimes when we pray, we begin to pray to our God with Jacob in mind. Some of you have prayed or you've heard others pray, and they say, 
a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't just say God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just to say it. It's not just a cliche. It is not something that we just merely use casually or culturally. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is how they would identify the true and living God of the universe. Because you do know that there are other people who profess that there are other gods. There are moon gods and a sun god and fertility gods, Greek mythology, all of these different types of gods. But the God that we adore, the God that we honor, the God that we worship is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God to whom we cater, the God to whom we uh, pay homage and respect, if you will, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, that that God, the God who says, I am that I am, the Elohim, the first God we are introduced to in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. That is the triune God, Elohim, the triune God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the God who spoke to himself and said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, the creator God. That's the God we serve, the creator God, the God who exemplified his creativity in creation by simply speaking the word. And whatsoever he said, let there be became the all-powerful, the self-sustaining, all-sufficient God. He who is wider than around and straighter than across. Uh, geography and geometry cannot measure his depths and the architects can't lay his foundation and biology cannot understand his life. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Death can't kill him and the grave can't hold him and water can't drown him and fire can't burn him. Beasts can't eat him up and Uncle Sam can't ration him out. Voters can't impeach him. That is the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that just when you find out he's one thing, you'll discover that he's another thing. Just when you get accustomed to calling him a God who will give you bread when you're hungry, you'll turn around and find out he'll be water when you're thirsty. This is the God that you can't quite put your finger on. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. It is interesting, though, that he would be the God of Jacob because Jacob, quite frankly, was a trickster. Jacob was something else. He came out the womb with issues. You know you a mess. When they, can, they can't even call you a sweet little innocent baby because he wasn't innocent. He was guilty on the way out of the womb. Can I tell you how, how messed up Jacob was? When Jacob came out the womb, he came out with his twin brother Esau. Esau came out first. Jacob came out behind him. But when Jacob was coming out, he grabbed on to the heel of his brother. And therefore, he got the name Jacob, meaning heel snatcher and heel grabber. I don't mean to throw no shade, but I wish to God that he would just eliminate all the Jacob heel grabbers in your life. That it looks like every time you're getting ready to come out, they want to pull you back in. I'm talking about them crabs in the bucket that it look like you're trying to get a blessing and they won't, They feel like they are entitled to what it is that you have. So they have to grab onto your ankles and onto your heels. Freeloaders, you know, people with that get over spirit. Soon as you get paid, they talking about how much we got. Did we work? Come on, talk to me when you can. Is we paying these bills? No, the devil is a lie. Uh, look at your name and tell them, get rid of Jacob. Get rid of Jacob. Get rid of Jacob. Get, get, get rid of Jacob. Get rid of Jacob. They, they, they have that spirit, that self-entitlement. That's, that, that's, what sort of, that's what sort of tripped me out when I discovered that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. But check this out. He's even the God of Jacob because how you act don't change who he is. That's shouting ground right there, and I didn't come here to shout too hard today, but I, I feel one coming because it doesn't matter how I act. It doesn't change who God is. He is the God of an Abraham. He's the God of an Isaac, and he is the God of a Jacob, which means that if he can be the God of a trickster, he can be the God of anybody else. We don't have, we don't own the blueprint or the copyright on God. He can be everybody's God. He is our Father, which art in heaven. Stop trying to keep people from God because you feel like they don't qualify for Him. 
Stop telling me when you can. Stop, stop trying to kick people to the curb and say God is not available for you. The same grace that brought you safe thus far is the same grace that can bring Shaniqua and Pookie and Kui Kui and Ray Ray and all of them. The same God that saved them. The same God that saved you is the same God that can save them. He is the God of Jacob. He was a trickster. He was a heel grabber. And it didn't, this is what tripped me out, it didn't just happen in birth when he didn't even understand what he was doing. But it happened as he got older. It happened as he got older. Now, mind you, he and Esau were twins, which means they looked just alike. But the only difference between the two is that their voices were a little different, and Esau had more hair on his body than did Jacob. But here's a conundrum, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but I might as well say this is part of the narrative. The mother loved her some Jacob. But the father loved him some Esau. One parent liked one child more than the other, and the other liked the other child more than the other. And so Rebecca, the mother, pulls Jacob to the side and say, baby, I want you to go in there because you know your daddy can't see. He old now. He done got up in the age, and his sight ain't what it once was. Somebody in here know what that is, that the sight ain't what it once was. It used to be 20-20, and I was like 10-3, you know, I don't know what the numbers mean or nothing. It's just, it just look at somebody and tell them that mean it ain't that good. It ain't. I, I can't. I can't see like I used to. It's it's a little blurry. You know, you got to change the prescription in your eyeglasses because it ain't strong enough. But Jacob was a mess at this point because I don't think they had glasses back then, and so no no corrective lens. Wasn't no laser surgery. If you had lazy eye, it just didn't work. You know, I mean that's just. How it was. It was just all messed up. And he was legally blind. He, he could hardly see. And so his mother dressed him up to look like Esau. Dressed him up, sent him in the room, and tricked the dad into giving Jacob the blessing that was supposed to be given to the oldest son, Esau. His father sort of had an inclination as someone, right? He said, you know, you feel like Esau, but you don't really sound like Esau, but but if you say that you Esau, I'm going to go ahead and give you the blessing. And he gives the birthright. The blessing is on Jacob and not on Esau. And after this trickster tricked, he had to go on a trip. He ends up leaving because if it's one thing you don't do, you don't take nobody's blessing. I don't care how holy and how righteous you are. You don't take nobody blessing, man. When, when you know it's something that's due to you and it's supposed to be given to you, you don't want nobody taking your stuff. You don't like no thief coming in your house. You done work hard for your stuff and you come in the house and somebody done came in there and took it. Don't all your Holy Ghost leave out of you? Don't all that anointing and all of that favor just sort of creep up out of you? Y'all looking all holy and sanctimonious, but you go home and find out somebody done took your stuff, man. You you calling the police and Ray Ray them. You're like, man, we we going looking for these fools in Jesus' name. Like, we finna ride. I wish I would see somebody wearing my shirt or my blouse or my shoes, man. We, we gonna have to be bailing you out of jail. They call a, a collect call. Like, oh, who it is now? Pastor, they didn't got me. <laughs> I got you for what, man? They stole my stuff, and I went and got it back like OJ. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to throw that one in there, man. X that off the app, all right? He might listen to it one day. But here's the point. Here's the point. He steals the birthright, which now puts him on the run from his own brother. I want to ask you a question. Is what you took worth it? W was it really a blessing if you had to run with it? W was it really a blessing if it added sorrow with it? Proverbs teaches us, we know this in Bible study, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow with it. So is it really a blessing if you got to hide the blessing when you get it? Is it, really, is it really a blessed situation? Is it really a blessed atmosphere or a blessed environment if you got to get it and then put it in your pocket for fear that somebody's going to see it? 
he runs away. But however, the blessing of God is still on his life. Don't get it twisted. And that's the funny thing. He didn't have to steal a blessing. He didn't have to trick his brother out of a blessing. He didn't have to trick his daddy out of blessing him when God had already promised that he was going to be a blessing to his seed for generations to come. He didn't understand that God had already made a covenant with his grandfather, Abraham, that I'm going to bless your seed and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Here's what gets me about a whole lot of church folk, kingdom people, is that we will, we will scratch and scrape trying to get a blessing that God said is already yours. You working extra harder that you got to you got to work overtime spiritually trying to get something that God has said is yours automatically. Talk to me when you get to church. The blessing was already on his life. God had already had his life under construction, already mapped it out. He didn't have to steal a blessing in order to be blessed because God was already going to bless him. And when he leaves his house, when he leaves his brother, he goes and lives with his with his uncle uh, Laban. And when he gets over there with Laban, he discovers that Laban got a daughter, and she fine. <laughs> Laban had a daughter so fine that when Jacob saw her, he passed out. Oh, my goodness. A man got weak in the knee. His name was Rachel. When he saw Rachel, oh, my gosh. She was one of them thank you Jesuses as soon as he saw her. I mean, it was like hallelujah, speaking in tongues. Like, I want her. Laban said, all right, if you want her. You're going to have to work for. No, this woman is worth waiting for and worth working for. And for seven years, he worked for free just to get her. Seven years. Imagine a woman that you look at and say, you know what, for the next seven years. Every year go down. Five more years. <laughs> Four more years, you're going to be mine. Three more years. By this time next year, we're going to be husband and wife. Seven years worked for. And after he worked seven years, he ends up, watch this, not getting Rachel, but getting her sister Leah. Now, Jacob, you know how he felt about this. You know he had to be mad. Because Leah, she wasn't no Rachel. Just keep it, just keep it, you know, nice, you know. <laughs> Rachel was fine, but that Leah, we're like, y'all got the same mama? Like, how, how you that fine and she that? No, you sure you ain't adopted? She, <laughs> the Bible says, the Bible says she was not pleasing to the eye. When the Bible call you ugly. <laughs> The Bible said thou art ugly. That's you know, you can't even argue with that if the Bible says so. Worked seven years <laughs> and didn't get Rachel. Got Leah. Wow. Jacob felt some kind of way. Well, let me say this. He couldn't feel too bad about it because sometimes what goes around. tricked your brother now after seven years the Rachel you wanted turned out to be a Leah so now Laban says if you really want her like you say you want her wait seven more years and after seven years Rachel was just as fine then as he was when he first saw her and he said you know what I'll work seven more years if you think it was something to wait and work seven years for a woman, try 14 years. 14 years just to say, I'm going to make you mine. Work seven more years, and after seven more years had passed, 365 days a year, seven more time, he finally got his Rachel. When he got his Rachel, he hugged her, he kissed her. The Bible says when he kissed her, he started crying. You know she had to be some kind of sister that when he kissed, oh, oh. The Bible says he wept. I don't know what kind of lips them was, but when he kissed her, he wept. 
because what he wanted, he waited for it and he worked for it for 14 years and it was everything that she expected. Everything that he expected. Although he had lived first, he said, if I got to go through the ugly to get to the beautiful, I will go through the ugly to get to the beautiful. And I ain't just talking about in the physical appearance. I'm saying many times in your life, if you want to get to the beauty, you got to go through the ashes. And so now he's gone to Laban. He has met his wife. He's blessed. He's prosperous. Got a little money in the bank. Got him two wives. Got him a few children. I, I never understood. As bad looking as Leah was, he sure kept making babies with her. I never understood that. It was so funny. And one day I'm going to talk to you about the, the Leah syndrome because she said maybe after this child he'll love me. And he still didn't love her like she wanted to be loved. And so she said, well, maybe if I give him another one, he'll love me. Wh who is it that you keep dropping babies just to get somebody to love you? I'm going to talk to you about that Leo syndrome in 2019. Ain't going to give it to you today, though. I'm talking about that in a women's conference or something. We're going to do a women's conference one night. Do that. But here's the point that I want to make to you, that as this moment begins to ensure and goes to another level where he is now blessed, he realizes this town ain't big enough for the two of us, so now Jacob has to go elsewhere and to establish his own camp. But he finds out, here it is in chapter 32, that for him to get to where he's trying to be, he got to go through his brother Esau. Because Esau got blessed anyway. Even though his brother stole his blessing, Esau still got blessed anyway. He was in the land of Edom, the Edomites. And in order for Jacob to get to where he was going, he had to pass by way of Edom, which was the territory where his brother ruled. Which is why I want to say something to you in passing before I get to these three principles. I want to say something to you in passing that, that when people have done you, stop chasing them for an apology. I hope, I hope you begging people to apologize to you. Stop begging people to finally do right by you because here's what God wants me to tell you. That when people have violated you and have done you wrong, they can't even get to their next blessing until they come through you. I hope you're hearing that in the spirit. They can't get there till they come by way of you. It's some folks that realize they can no longer afford to avoid you, so they're going to have to pick up the phone. They're going to have to apologize. They're going to have to say, I'm sorry. They're going to have to write you a letter or something, which is why I'm telling people I'm living my best life right now. I'm living my best life life right now and please don't get it twisted it ain't cuz I got millions of dollars it ain't cuz I got a mansion out on a hill it ain't because I got a chicken in every pot it ain't cuz I got a car in every garage I ain't even got a garage for for that matter but here's the point that I am making to you I'm living my best life right now and here's why because I chose not to go back and forth with people are you hearing me I don't do the tit for tat. I, I don't go back and forth. Like, like I, I, don't, I don't do the arguing thing no more. Like, that season is over for me. Like, I said what I got to say, and I'm through with it. Now, you know, if you want to argue, if you want to cuss me out, you can go home and do that and, and, and just stay up all night long. I promise you I'm going to sleep. I ain't thinking twice or thrice about what you're talking about. Once I've said my piece and feel what I feel and get from God what I needed to get from God, I'm done with the situation. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. I ain't offended. I ain't mad at you. I ain't going to do nothing to hurt you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do everything that I can to help you. But I'm in my best life right now because I refuse to go back and forth, especially people that have done me wrong. Because I'm convinced that before God will take them to the next level, they're going to have to come back by way of me. You ain't got to chase them down. You ain't got to hunt nobody. You just keep doing your thing. One day you're going to get a knock on the door, a letter in the mail or a text on your phone saying, you know what, I should have never done that to you. So don't worry, Esau, because if Jacob going to go where he's going, he got to come through your hood. He got to come through way of your territory, which now causes him to be in the fight of his life because he doesn't know after all these years, 14 years, hadn't seen his brother, hadn't talked to him, don't know how his brother's feeling. Don't know if his brother still got a grudge. 
his brother is still mad. He's trying to figure out, I will preach a piece of this message. He's trying to figure out how to greet Esau. What do you do when you don't know how folk feel about you? And you have to enter into their environment, into their territory. Can you imagine the panic, the ambiguity, the duplicity, the ambivalence, uh, the uncertainty? Can you imagine the friction that has to exist? I don't know if my brother going to be glad to see me after 14 years or if he's going to attack me for what I did for him. I don't, I don't know if he's going to love me or if he's going to hate me. I don't know if he's going to hug me or stab me in my back. I don't know what he's going to do. So he did what you would do. He sent gifts to him. <laughs> he didn't go himself. He sent his servants. Hey, 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 I'm blessed. The Lord been good to me. Hey, send some of these oxen over there. Tell them this is from your brother, Jacob. You know, what up, bro? trying to bribe his brother for a blessing after he stole one from him. The oxen want enough. Give him some sheep now. Let me go in the 21st century. You know what? Let's figure out what size you were. I'm going to send him some J's. <laughs> Put some J's on his feet. You know, s- send him a ring over there. What size you wear, six? Send the tailor over there. Get his measurements. Send a couple tailor-made suits. Two-piece and three-piece. Double breasted. Alligator shoes. You know, send him some over there. You know what? Send him this envelope. Put this check in my bank. That sounds like a case in point where we would rather have the sacrifice instead of the obedience. We would rather obedience better than sacrifice. I would rather you not treat me wrong than for you to mistreat me and then try to pay for it. And even after all that, let me say this to you. Even after all that, he still didn't know how his brother was going to treat him. Have you ever wasted your substance and still didn't know how people were going to do you? (laughs) Talking to all the brothers. If you could get back all of your trying to get her money. You remember that? You remember that? Uh, all the rare fellas down you, but you remember that? It was a long, long time ago, but you remember that? You remember that? Like, <laughs> you know, you, know, you try, try to drop as much paper as you could just to see, you know, take it to all these fancy restaurants. And let me tell you what a fancy restaurant is nowadays, the movies. <laughs> Boy, it costs to go to the movies. Ticket price. You want popcorn too? God, dog. And I want some candy. Candy? A big drink costs you about fourteen dollars. <laughs> like you sitting in the car, be like, look. Before we go in this movie, I need to know is we gonna be together or what? Cause I ain't trying to spend this kind of money on hot dogs, seven dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> And you did all that, and you didn't even know if she was going to like you. You didn't even know if she was going to marry you or not. You, 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 didn't even, you didn't even know if you were going to get no sugar to make you cry. <laughs> Y'all made me sick, man. Y'all holy. I'm going to say that at Hoover. They going to know what I mean, you know. <laughs> ain't it funny? Ain't it funny? Let me give you the spiritual. Ain't it funny how much we'll give to people not knowing what they're going to do for us, but we won't give nothing to God, and we know he'll take care of us? Yeah. See how I came in in the back door with that right there, you know. And so now he's in the fight of his life. Let me give you these three points, and I got to raise up. He's in the fight of his life, and here's number one. He's got to fight it by himself, by himself. Verse 22, check it out. It's still in your Bible if you ain't tear it up. Verse 22 says, that as he's getting ready, and I'm paraphrasing, to go over the Jabbok River, the Jabbok River. If you, if this isogetically, if you replace the last letter with the beginning letter in that word Jabbok, it'll read Jacob. He's got to go over the Jabbok River. I, I call it like the Jacob River because it was the one river that he had to cross before he got to the next level. That's just in my mind's eye. That's my spiritual mind. And... He goes over there, 
and leaves his two wives, his two wives' servants, and his 11 sons. Did you notice that? He got rid of every last one of them because he understood that I'm going to have to face Esau face to face by myself. Here it is. You know when you're in the fight of your life when you come to the reality that you're going to have to go at it by yourself. If you can fight the fight you in with an army full of people, it ain't the fight of your life yet. The fight of your life is one that you're going to have to handle it all by yourself. And can I tell you why the reason why I won't nobody help you is because in this season of your life, can't nobody help you. And the reason can't nobody help you is because every now and then, God will shun you from your support system. He will intentionally shield you from the system of supporters that you were used to and accustomed to having. He will shun you from your support system. A pastor friend of mine called me last month around Classic Weekend. He said, man, I need to ask you kind of a personal question. I said, go ahead and shoot. He said, man, do you ever find yourself being lonely? I said, yeah, occasionally I do find myself being lonely. He said, well, how is that? Well, you got a lot of people around you, man. You surrounded a lot of people in your life. Like You got friends, you got family. I mean, you got church family and all that. How do you ever find yourself being lonely? He said, is it at certain seasons or certain times of the year, certain events? He said, like the class. He said, man, I'm here at the house by myself, man. And normally I have people, but everybody out there tailgating. Ain't got nobody to talk to. I said, no, I don't feel lonely on special days and events and holidays or anything like that. I said, I feel the most lonely when when God speaks to me in prayer. He said, well, how could you feel lonely when God speaks to you in prayer? Because that should be inspiring and empowering that God is speaking to you. I said, no, don't get it twisted. It empowers me and it inspires me when I feel the Holy Spirit speaking to me. But the problem is when God speaks, he don't talk like people talk. So if I repeat what God said to people who didn't hear what God said, then it leaves me in a vulnerable condition because they don't know like I know what he said to me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So that's when the loneliness has a tendency to set in. And here's what I want to say to you, that there are seasons where God deals with you personally and privately. And the reason that won't nobody help you is because can't nobody help you. And the reason they can't help you is because they don't understand you. They can't help you because they don't feel your pain. And when people don't have your problems, they will never understand your solutions. When they don't have your questions, they'll never understand your answers. Are you in here with me? People without your struggles will never understand your goals. That's why they tell you to hush. Because they ain't in the pain you in. It's easy, I keep telling you, it's easy for married folk to tell single people to wait and be patient. You got to boo. You got somebody. It's easy to say wait and be patient when you got somebody, but when you don't and you want somebody, it ain't that easy not to pick up the phone and be like, hey, what you doing? It's easy when all your bills are paid to tell everybody else, just be patient, your day going to come. You ain't got to try to work all them hours. All your bills are paid, mine aren't. So if I got to work a little overtime and two or three jobs, leave me alone. People without your pains do not understand your goals. And that's why you got to fight by yourself because they couldn't help you even if they wanted to because they don't understand where you are. So God will shield you from the company and from the assistance of people that used to be able to help you because there is a fight in your life that you have to send your 11 sons and your four women away. You got the, the 15 people he had to say, listen, y'all can't go like this with me. Uh, the fight is so big that I'm afraid you could get hurt in the process. That's when you know it's the fight of your life when you can't ask for help where you got to send your help away because if some pop off, I don't want you to get caught up in the fight of my life. I want to say this in passing. Stop getting mad and frustrated at folk who don't help you. It ain't their responsibility. It ain't their job to help you. God wants to get the credit when you come out of it. And if you got everybody doing something, you're going to have to thank everybody, including him. And sometimes God wants to be thanked exclusively. You hear me exclusively. It's a fight that you got to go at by yourself. 
by your Jacob, you got to fight it by yourself. I know, I know you ain't used to that because especially us, especially some of us in here, we, we, we good at this. We are good at adopting the spirit of always needing to be saved. Always needing to be helped. Uh, al- always need somebody to rescue us. And that becomes our way. The moment we need some, we think of who we gonna ask to get it from. Not how we can make it happen for ourselves. Joshua chapter one, he says, if you would attend to the law of this book, you shall be prosperous. Then you shall have good success and you shall make your way prosperous. Like everybody else doing it for you. Every now and then, you gotta be like Joe Brown, say, I get myself. Yeah, you ain't gotta get me nothing. Now, if you over there by the door, you open the door for me, I get it myself. Now, you ain't got to do, you can tell me where water is. You ain't got to leave me over there. <laughs> Give me the address. I'll GPS that thing myself. If I got to walk, I'll get there. But there's a fight of your life that you got to fight by yourself. Here's number two. Not only must you fight by yourself, number two, you got to fight it with yourself. The biggest fight of your life, stop thinking this, is not with them folks on your job. You can't. You you hate Mondays because you got to go back and fight with these folks. You gonna forever be fighting because you don't even know that ain't been the fight. The biggest fight is to fight with you. That's the fight. Can I tell y'all something? Be transparent. It's easy for me to tell other people no. I struggle telling me no. I wonder, I wonder, can you tell you no? Because you can surely tell your cousin no. Soon as they call, before you answer it, no. Because you know they finna ask for something. But when a sale come on, can you tell you no? Can you tell, you know, I mean, every time you see the right flesh, can you tell, you know? Y'all get on my nerves getting a hold of this. Can you, can you tell, you know? Can you tell, can you see, can you see a certain meal and tell, you know? I'm not going to eat that. No, I'm not going to eat it this time. Can can you see an opportunity to go off on somebody and say, you know, I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. That's what the devil want me to do. He want me to lose my temper like that. I ain't going to do it. I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. That, that's why I don't talk much about it, but that's why fasting is so important. Because it's looking at a meal. It's looking at food. It's looking at something physical that you need, but you're saying, God, I need you more than I need it. So I'm telling me no. That's why when other people tell you no, it don't bother you because you used to telling yourself no. And if I can tell me no, I know I can handle your no. The biggest fight in your life is to fight with yourself. I'm not finna cuss about this. No, I'm not gonna let you get under my skin. The fight of your life is with you. It's not with your spouse. You going home arguing at everybody else when the only person you need to argue with is the one in the middle. Come on, talk to me, y'all. Don't make, me, don't make it seem like I'm out here by myself. The biggest fight is to fight with me. Jacob has to fight with himself. Now, you saying I don't see that in the text. That's because you ain't reading it right. He wrestled with a man all night long. And after the fight was over, he says, you have wrestled with God and with man, and you have prevailed. You know that can't be true because you can't fight God and win. That's an anthropomorphic term. Don't let that word scare you. It's simply a term or a phrase that is used to describe an action that God didn't really take. It's just said in a way to get you some level of understanding in the natural about something that's more spiritual. When he says you fought with God and with man and you have prevailed, it's not that you beat God. You can't beat God. You can't conquer God. Your arms are too short to even box with God. So you know you can't beat God, but you are fighting against something that was you. Wrestling with yourself because to wrestle with God is to wrestle with yourself. 
when God sets a standard and you think it's too high for you to reach it, the fight ain't with God. The fight is with you as to whether or not you can abide by the standard that he set. God will say something and you got a different feeling about it. And now you fighting with yourself. God, you're going to have to help me get to that level. If someone smites you on one cheek, turn to him the other cheek. If you can't do that, the fight is not with God. The fight is with you. I got to work on me. And how many people take responsibility for the fight that they're in? All I'm saying is, man, if people in your life get worse when you're around and you think that it's all on them, can you stop for a moment and say, maybe it happened under my watch? Maybe it happened under my watch. If your children didn't turn out the way you wanted to, it, it happened under my watch. Because they are immediately responsible, but I am ultimately responsible. If anything don't go right in this ministry, although there are people assigned to it, they are immediately responsible. But at the end of the day, I'm ultimately responsible. You'll be like, White, what's up? What's going on? If, if the sound ain't working, they're going to be looking at me. Immediately, Reg is responsible. But ultimately, like, man, I went over there. I ain't even had no sound. I don't know what White doing over there. If the choir don't sound good, immediately, music ministry, responsible. Barry, uh, Twan, uh, uh, Brandon, responsible for what you hidden, what you planned on those keys and instruments. But if the choir horrible, man, church was good. Man, White going to have to do something about that music ministry. Let the bills not get paid. Let payroll not get hit. Let they direct deposit not come through. They're going to shoot me a text. Pastor, i check my account. I'm not immediately responsible. I don't call the payroll company and, and, and make it to go through and all that. Somebody else said, but let it not hit. They're going to call me up. Let a bill not get paid. Like, man, we went in the water, went on. What happened, White? You ain't paid the You ain't paid the bill? I'm not immediately responsible because it's been delegated to somebody, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's going to fall on me. So if it does well, I might get credit. But if it goes wrong, even if I ain't immediately responsible, I got to take the blame. I got to apologize. It happened under my watch. I don't hear too many pastors putting no blame on themselves. Church ain't growing, ain't no finances there. These folk won't do nothing. They won't help me at the end of the day, bro. Ultimately, it's your fault. Man, it gets worse. You made me this way. But I am still myself. I wouldn't be this crazy if you wouldn't be messing with my mind. The fight is with yourself. If you're going off on your job, it can be 20 heathens. You the one Christian. Your one Christianity should override their 20 heathenistic ways. The fight is with yourself. I got to fight with me. And the moment I can conquer me is the moment I can conquer the life that I have. Look at your name and tell them, I got to get me under control. I got to get me under control. I got I to stop blaming everybody else for my shortcomings and, and for the things that ain't happening. Listen, I, I know you don't want to hear that. I'm going to tell you, you broke because of you. You is broke because of you. If I'm broke, it's because of me. It's, it's, it's on me. It, it's on me. It's on me. The fight is with myself. Maybe I shouldn't have bought an outfit. <laughs> I would have it if I didn't spend it on that. I got to think for my money instead of letting my money think for me. It's my fault. I didn't do my part. I got to fight with myself. The Bible says, if you judge yourself, other won't have to do it for you. So when they come to you and tell you what's wrong with you, you can already tell them, I know that and I've been working on that. You know what? You talk too much. No, I don't. You, you probably do. <laughs> if everybody you get with dumps you, the problem ain't them. The fight is with me. I'm getting ready to leave, man. Now y'all don't want to hear this no more. I get it, but the fight is with me. 
and Jacob wrestles all night long, a mirror match with himself. No wonder he couldn't prevail because when you fight against you, you know what you're getting ready to do. So if you finna throw a punch, you know you need to move. You can't beat yourself. So he says, the, the dawning has come. It is broken. Let me go. If I was Jacob, I'd be like, bro, you came here to fight me. How you going to tell me to let you go? You crazy. I ain't picked the fight with you, and you want to stop the fight. No, we're going to finish this fight because here's what I want to say in, in closing. If I had to fight this long, you think I ain't getting no blessing out of it? You crazy. <laughs> of all the stuff you've been through in your life, who in here feel like me? I want something to show for it. You had to bring up the real all those years of your life. You applauded for everybody else. You helped other people. And now you had to go through the worst season of your life to come out of it empty-handed. The devil is a lie. If you made me miss my sleep, if I missed some meals because of this, if I had to go through some chaotic circumstances and situations as a result of what I'm doing, and you think that I'm not going to get a blessing out of it, the devil has lied to you. The benefit of a war is a thing called called spoils, spoils from war. He says, you held me all night long, so I will not let, let you go until you bless me. You got to bless me. Out of all this time, you got to bless me. Baby, if I gave you this many years of my life and you're talking about it's over, the devil is a lie. Alimony. <laughs> Child support. Something. If I put up with your mess all these years, you're you going to break me off properly. Some way, somehow, I ain't leaving empty-handed. Where are all the people in this room that know you've been through too much to live the rest of your life empty-handed? I ain't going through that much hell, and I have something to show for it. All the people that I prayed for, I stayed for, I lifted them up, I encouraged them. I was there for them when nobody else was there for them. I talked to them late in the midnight hour when they own friends and own pastors didn't even have time for I deserve to have something to show for all the pain that I had to endure. And it ain't going to be over until I get my blessing. You ought to find your name and tell him, I'm going to get my blessing. If I have to shake it out of the devil, I'm going to get my blessing. If I got to pray into tears stream down my face, I'm going to get my blessing. I want my loot. I want my paper. I want my blessing. I want my favor. I want my anointing. I want my power. I won't let it go until it blesses me. I feel God in the place. I want what God has for me. Hallelujah. I ain't letting you go until you bless me. And so he, he knocks his hip out of socket. Said, so you want to be blessed? Touched his hip, knocked it out of joint. And you saying, hold up, God. I said, I want a blessing. And now I'm walking with a limp. You don't even understand that your blessing always comes across as a burden. It only looks like a burden. But the limp one them but a constant reminder that every time he walked, it was by the grace of God. Every time he was able to bless somebody, it was by the, by the grace of God. Every time he was able to take care of his children, it was by the grace of God. That's why I believe that God is going to bless you. But when God blesses you, he might have to give you a limp to go along with it. Just in case you think about getting the big head along the way. Just in case when you start making that six-figure salary and when your millions of dollars start coming in, it's going to remind you every morning you get up out the bed that if God don't hold my hand, I ain't going to be able to hold myself up. God, if you don't take care of me, I won't be able to take care of my responsibilities. I know you're a man and you got it going on, but you can't even provide for your family if God don't help you take care of them. He gave you a limp for a reason. He causes you to walk with your head held low for a reason so that it can remind you that if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you never would have made it. Can you just throw your hand up and say, God, I thank you for my limp. 
I thank you for my struggle. I thank you for my pain. I thank you for the fight that I had to go through. Because if I never had a problem, how would I know that you could solve it? If I've never been thirsty, how could I know you could give me water when I'm thirsty? If I've never been hungry, how would I know that you can feed me in a starving land? Thank you for every mountain you brought me over. For every valley you saw me through. For every blessing I didn't deserve it. Thank you. Yeah. Knock this hip out of joint and said, here's the real blessing. Here's the real blessing. Here's the real blessing. The fight of your life, you're not leaving empty handed. He says, here's your blessing. I ain't finna put no money in your hand. I ain't finna give you the keys to no brand new car. I'm not finna give you a house or anything like that. I am gonna change your name. Your name is no longer Jacob. It's Israel. Watch this. Israel just ain't the name of a place. It's the name of a person. And while you're trying to give credit to the place, it was the person that called the place to become. And when God called him Israel, the name Israel means prince. Here's the real blessing. His name was Jacob, which meant trickster. When God changed his name, that also meant, y'all don't shout too loud, he was changing his nature. Because my name change changes my nature. And when my nature change, my nature change changes my whole entire life. And I want to tell you that since you have survived the worst seasons of your life, hear me prophetically when I tell you that your life will never be the same again. You no longer have to settle for second place, for third place. You ain't just got to take what people give you. Your name has been changed. Your life has has been changed. I ain't gonna let you talk to me like that no more. I'm a new person. You can't do me like that. I'm a new person. I ain't gotta receive you calling me out of my name because my name has been changed. Somebody give him glory. Come on, somebody give him honor. Lift up a sound of worship in here. I made it through the fight. We're getting ready to pray. But I told you he had to fight by himself, right? I told you he had to fight it against himself. Lastly, he found out he had to fight for himself. It was his blessing. I, I know it's nice, gesture. You're trying to do a lot for other people. What if I told you that until you start doing it for yourself, you getting ready to let a whole lot of people down. A brother spoke for almost 40 years. He said, I tried to quit for my wife. I tried to quit for my kids, for my grandkids. He said, I was in the store, and I had just bought a pack of cigarettes. I just bought a pack of cigarettes. And he said, a guy in the store said, man, you just got to have them cigarettes, don't you? Every time I see you, you here getting some cigarettes. He looked at me and said, no, I ain't got to have them. He said, at that moment, I decided to stop for myself. He said, I just bought them and I threw them in the trash and ain't pick them up no more. He said, the moment I decided to quit for me. Because if you're doing it for your kids and your grandkids, God forbid, what if you outlive them? Then who do you have to impress? You still got yourself left. So I got to fight this for myself, for my own future. I can't take care of my generations to come if I don't look out for me. I got to be good for me. If I'm going to be a leader, he said, I can't be a leader and be broke. I can't be a father and not have no provision. So I got to go through this fight for myself, with myself, by myself. And Jacob had 12 sons and a daughter and was able to take care of everybody because he endured the fight of his life. Father, I want to pray for you. Now, Father, as we lift our hands and we lift our hearts, many of us are going through the craziest season of our life, the fight of our life. I'm praying, God, that you would now open up every door that needs to be opened. 
as we endure this battle, we can't travel this highway by ourselves. We need your strength. We need your guidance. While we are in isolation, give us the ammunition we need to be victorious. As we do it by ourselves, with ourselves, for ourselves, we believe, God, that when we come out of this, all the credit and the glory and the honor will be yours. You will never have to question if we don't do right by giving you praise. Because every time you bless us, we let the whole world know it was because of you. Now, God, I pray that this week would be a better week for us. That we now have clarity that anybody who's not there for us, we cannot afford to be offended because it's not their battle to fight anyway. So, God, we go through it with the strength and the help of thee, O oh God, praying that our lives are going to be better. 18 was good, but 19, we're getting ready to go to another level. We thank you by faith that it's already in the books. It's already done. And we give you praise for the victory in this fight. If you receive that, I want you to give God a great big amen. Give God a hand of thanksgiving.